Hey everyone. Welcome to St. Peter's annual TED Talks. My name is Mark. And mine is Nico. And we're going to talk to you about the TED Talks. So I know you all could be bored or you guys are forced to go here, but all I want to say is that TED Talks are quite are, are amazing and I think you should all listen to them. TED Talks were first said in some TED conferences all around the world. Uh, they are used to express ideas and concerns. And we empower all students at St. Peter's to use their voice in this form. Um, I know, now that we're done with the boring stuff, let's start the speeches. Okay, so with the first speaker, we have the one and only Arnau who will talk about a topic that takes a big part in our lives, but we it goes under the radar, so we don't know, but he will explain about it. So welcome Arnau. Oh, that is a terrible picture of me. Um, conflict. We all know conflict. It is inevitable. Just look at the past 2,000 years in human history. It's always there. We can't run from it. But I think I have found a way to sort of escape it, even for a little while. What is that, you might ask? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Now, you may be wondering, what? Yes. Let me just explain. Now, I'm sure we're all familiar with. I mean, I would even bet a big amount of money. We've been fed fiction since we were children. With that. And I believe that fiction can help us deal with of our daily lives. Fiction is a very broad concept, and I've nailed it down to four, which is movies, TV shows, video, books. Um. Anyways, and now for these four concepts, and if oh, it's a brief intermission. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, testing, testing. Okay. Yeah. So, we'll go over these four uh, concepts of fiction, and we'll see if there really is a benefit to them. Let's begin with movies, films. Now, movies have been around for a while, ever since 1899, in fact. And since then, they have captured audiences' hearts all around the globe. But is there really a benefit to them? Yes. See, movies, they boost your mood. You go off on an adventure, you link with these characters, and you're sort of like there, in a way. It helps you forget what your troubles are, and you sort of bond with these characters, and you go on an adventure with them. There's also a thing called uh, cinema therapy, where a therapist might recommend a movie to their client, their patient, which sort of like has a relationship with what they're dealing with, and it may help them. So there's that. Then we have TV shows. Well, TV shows usually are longer than movies. They have a longer runtime. They go on for seasons. So it sort of helps your emotional attachment, according to the University of Nebraska. Um, they sort of help you have a more emotional uh, range, which you might see it as a good thing, as a bad thing. I see it as a good thing, you know? Uh, and if you see a TV show with someone, you start bonding with them. So it's also, it helps you be more social, let's say. Books. Now, books are the original. They've always been there, uh, even longer than movies. Even a movie or a TV show has a script. And there's sort of a 50-50, where books have to think that they're just words on a piece of paper. It's up to you to imagine these storylines, these characters. And this might either you know, make you feel more relaxed, more involved in all the action, or it might drive you insane, which could also uh, be a possibility, a very common possibility. Video games. Now, here is one that is an unusual case. Video games often are generally recognized as motivators of violence, of they're a hobby, you know, a way to pass the time. I don't think so. I think they act as a way of art. 
See, video games are the only form of fiction where you are directly involved in all the action. You, as the player, are there. You're doing these things, you're meeting these people, you're making these choices. You are there. This doesn't happen in movies, TV shows, or books. You're reading, you're watching, but in video games, you're playing the action. This means that you're actively thinking, meanwhile playing, you're thinking these choices, what to make, um, who to befriend. You have a deeper sense of empathy as you relate with these characters, because you are there. But we're missing a very big aspect here. We looked at types of fiction, but there's another type that's very important. Genres. Now, a Western isn't the same thing as a horror movie. They're completely different. So I researched a little bit, and according to the University the Mental Health Institute of California, there are three genres that help people lower their stress rate. These are comedy, which, I mean, it makes sense. We all like a big laugh. Romance. Yeah, love does make people feel good, usually. And adventure, which, yeah, it makes sense. So, I didn't believe these results, or I was, you know, I wanted to find my own. So I went on a little odyssey, and I interviewed a few people, I made a few polls, and these are the results. So, pers um, I asked these people two questions. If they consider themselves a stressful person, and what their favorite movie, TV show, book was. Thing is, I sort of tricked them, because I didn't really care what their favorite book, movie, TV show was. I wanted the genre. And these are the results. See, the people that answered that they have a low stress level, the highest one was comedy. Wow, what a surprise. Action is up, up there, which, yeah, sure. And romance is also as well. Um, horror is up there, which it's a bit strange, but there are strange people out there, so sure. And if we go over here on this side, we'll see that there are the percentage of high stress people that answered. Uh, war is up there. War, no one likes war. Uh, drama, coincidence, I don't think so. So, with this, what is the conclusion? Where do we reach the conclusion? I believe that fiction can really help us deal with our daily, day -to day lives. I mean, we've seen it, the evidence is here. So, if you're ever feeling stressed, you're feeling down, sit back, make some popcorn, relax, watch a film, read a book, watch a TV show, play a game. Thank you. Okay, Mark, what do you want to say about this? Well, thank you, Arnal. I don't think anyone here realized how much fiction impacts our lives, nor did the video games. So, I really enjoyed this talk. Okay, now we would like to welcome our next speaker, a year 10 student who is named Christina and we'll talk about a topic that's very deep and opinionated, and I think it takes a lot of courage to talk about this. So welcome to stage, Christina. Well, let's begin with a question. How many genders are there in the world, you may think? Let's begin with a story, and let's come back to the question later. Well, in the year 2000, the Rose Boy uh, in Taiwan. Well, he was found dead in the toilet of his school. The school claimed that, oh, it's only an accident. However, of course, it is not. Well, after some investigation, it was being found that oh, he was often being bullied by his classmates just about uh, because of his appearance and also his gentle manner. But why does this thing happen? Well, people drag him to the toilet and of, uh, often say that, oh, let's check whether he's a boy or a girl. Well, uh, his parents and also like the teachers uh, know about this thing and try to prevent it. However, it doesn't really work well. And uh, until, uh, until the end, he was being bullied to this. Well, let's get into the topic. Good afternoon, my name is Christina, and today I'm going to talk about gender identity. Uh, I don't think this topic is really commonly known and discussed by people as, well, me, myself, become known to this topic a year or two before. 
And actually, I'm really interested in this topic, as I know it's not really commonly known. So therefore, I think there should be someone who actually speak up for this group of people, just for the equalness, just for the equality. Well, let's get into the definition. Uh, the gender uh, is a combination of multiple factors that, as can be seen here, there's attraction, the sex, the expressions. Many people, what people think about sex, it's about how the chromosome uh, decides them, a, a male or a female. However, there's also another thing called gender identity. Gender identity is what you identify yourself as. There could be male, there could be female, there could be both, or any other genders that I'm going afterwards. Well, uh, not very, uh, as not very many people know about gender identity, well, and they can't choose their gender because it, they're born with that specific, uh, specific gender and they can't change it. They don't have any choice. However, you have a chance if you're from Argentina. In the year, tw uh, in the year 2012, uh, Argentina became the first country who passed a law to uh, the transgender law, which allows more people to uh, change their gender, whether uh, it's free hormone therapy and free transgender uh, operation. And it's unlimited. Uh, they, can, uh, they can change their gender whenever they want, and as long as they want to become the other gender, the gender that they identify themselves as. As well as Spain, which uh, also passed its uh, transgender law in 2021, which is two years ago. Well, it's a good news for those people who have gen uh, other gender identity, as well, it's another benefit is that they don't have to have any operations, neither therapy. They, they can just change their gender on their identity card. They don't have to do anything, just simply just change it. Just they identify themselves as this kind of gender. Well, as I think that not many people know that there are a lot of transgender people. Well, this law actually benefits them. There's a lot of transgender people, uh, well, not transgender people, uh, they, have, uh, they have both genders. Like, the, uh, and actually, like, uh, it's called, like, uh, as I remember, it's like transsex, which is the intersex people. That one in 3,000 people among the world is actually intersex. They have both gender, they have both. They can be men, they can, they can be women, depends on how they identify themselves. Or if they want, they can be both. And well, as this is really a pretty high percentage among the overall population, well, the two laws that I uh, explained before actually benefits the society. Let's come back to the question from uh, I asked in the beginning. Uh, did anyone take a guess how many genders are there? Well, are there any adults want to take a guess? And the dad, uh, what do you think? Uh, your dad? Ten. Well, there's someone who gets right there. It's actually 72 genders. There are 72 genders in the world. There's a cisgender, where the most commonly known, which is female or male. Well, it's just, just one type of gender over the 72. Like male or female, actually there's one type. There's called the cisgender. But there are also other kinds, for example, transfluids and many other genders. Or for example, a gender means that this person doesn't consider themselves belongs to any kind of gender. Or like for example, like so kind of gender fluid, which is like oh the there's a rate between like sometimes they consider themselves more to a male or more to a female and sometimes even less. Well as I mentioned before, there's 72 genders, and actually everyone should receive the same amount of respectfulness and understandings. And in the end, I would like to conclude with that you are you, and the true equality is 
when people actually understand you and respect it. They respect your decision, they respect you, they understand you. And please believe that there's always a lot of people that actually loves you. Thank you so much, Christina. So I actually never really know how many genders there were. If you ask some of the people here, they'll probably say that there were only two, but I think you've definitely changed some people's mind. Next up, we'd like to welcome to the stage someone who's not afraid of putting in the work. She's a strong independent woman who's about to dominate the stage with a wonderful yet <laughs> intriguing topic. Welcome, Aitian. Thank you. Have you ever asked yourself why you can't reach that goal perfectly? Simple, you are a human. Don't get me wrong. I know all of you here present in this theater are humans that can perfectly move, think, and talk. However, there's one thing that you just can't do. Does anyone up here you know? You can't exceed what's beyond possible. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I will be addressing how perfectionism is a dark shadow of oneself. Presentation. This is me, let's say. As you can see, I'm just a normal, decent student who goes to school like everyone else. And if you didn't know, there are three different types of perfectionism. Self-oriented, other-oriented, and social prescribed perfectionism. In my case, I fell into the trap of social prescribed perfectionism. This refers to individuals who believes that others have certain high standards for themselves, that they have to reach those high standards in order to be accepted, to be perfect. And that was exactly my problem. Since at the start of the school year, I was known in my class as one of the best presenters by my classmates. And I began to carry that label everywhere I went, as if that was all that mattered, to be seen as the best presenter. However, as time passed, the weight of that label started to take autonomy. I kept pressuring myself to do even, even better in terms of, oh, did I use effective body language? Did I make eye contact with the audience? Did I use intonation? Without realizing that my shadow was growing darker, bigger by each passing day. Until one day it happened. I made a mistake. Then the presentation of how Leonardo da Vinci influenced modern society. I forgot a crucial part. Suddenly, voices start echoing everywhere. It was my shadow. It had become so immense and dark that all I could see was a mist of darkness telling me, why? Why did you memorize it better? Now, you're going to lose that label of yours because you made this mistake. As I felt more guilt, and devastation, I collapsed emotionally. Because of this exact behavior and state of mindset where any mistake is intolerable, where everything has to be perfect, 30% of undergraduate students experience symptoms of depression, conducted by the study of Medical News Today. As well as 70% of young people who died by suicide were in the habit of creating exceedingly high expectations of themselves. I'm certain that as parents of two or three, daughter or son, you wouldn't wish for this to ever happen, right? No. Not only this, but perfectionism is also associated with clinical depression, eating disorders, and a receipt for chronic stress. Ladies and gentlemen, do you really want to, do you really wish to see this percentage continue increasing over time or help find a solution to it? Because remember, the rise in perfectionism doesn't mean each generation is becoming more accomplished. It means we're getting sicker, sadder, and even undermining our own potential. To be a healthy and successful human, you have to learn from your mistakes. There's this saying that what is scary is not when you make mistakes, it's when you don't realize that you're making those mistakes. But perfectionists like us, like everyone else in this world that are perfectionists, tend to avoid making mistakes altogether, sticking to tasks that feels most comfortable with and overreacting to obstacles. And creating high standards and expectations of themselves, which are basically impossible to reach. When they do make mistakes, they feel overwhelming guilt, shame, 
anger and despair. Then start abusing themselves emotionally. Just like how I, like how I was when I was too late to realize that my shadow had been feeding off all the toxic expectations I had accumulated throughout, the, throughout over time and grew stronger by each day. Ladies and gentlemen, the point I want to emphasize here is that perfection is an illusion in life. The reality, the reality is that we cannot traverse a flawless path. Now, it is crucial to question whether we truly want to live in a utopian world we have created where mistakes exist beyond our reach and the path is paved with ease or would we prefer a world where there's a balance between mistakes and accomplishments, even though the path is challenging and filled with obstacles? You choose your path, your life. Thank you. Thank you so much for that speech. If it wasn't for what you just told us, I would have said it was perfect. But as we've learned, it's not the case. Um, almost though. Um, so thank you so much. Okay, so next, we would like to welcome a vision leader, expert in mental health, who will, uh, who, who will like allow us to learn more about mental health. Sorry, sorry about that. So Reem, welcome to stage. Let's give a warm round of applause. How many of you have ever experienced exam stress? Maybe you felt anxious, nervous, or maybe had trouble sleeping before a big test. Well, if you're like mo most of people in this world, you probably experienced it. As someone who has personally felt this overwhelming effect of exam stress, I can say it, it's, it can really take a toll on your mental health and physical health. I remember feeling anxious, unable to sleep, and constantly worrying about my performance. It was a tough time for me, and I know, and I know how many of, and I know that many of you have felt this similar feeling. According to the World Health Organization, suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people, caused by stress of exams. I know how di how difficult it can be to manage these feelings, but I also know that there are some tips and advices to help. Let's face it. Exams can be an absolute brain buster, a kind of gut-wrecking exams that come with academic expectations and fear of failure, and, and the unknowns of the future that can leave you feeling in a reptile of anxiety. It's like trying to navigate a maze blindfolded with everyone shouting, di shouting out directions in different languages. To make matters worse, the constant pressure to perform well meet expectations and, and please everyone from professors and parents can create a toxic environment for students, leading to serious mental health consequences. We're talking sleepless nights, caffeine crashes, and a tower, a stack, a book stacks of, uh, and the towering stack of textbook that look like the, the leaning tower of Pisa. According to recent studies, there has been a con According to recent studies, there has been a concerning increase in the number of suicide linked to exam stress. It's heartbreaking to think that young people are feeling so overwhelmed they want to com contemplate to end their own lives. Even though exam stress is a powerful enemy, it's not unbeatable. You can take control of mental health if you arm yourself with the correct strategies. First up, don't forget the power of self-care. It's important to put yourself first and exercise, sleep well, and eat healthy. Next, don't be afraid to seek help. Seeking help from a friend, a teacher, or even a parent can really help your mental health. And finally, remember to the power of mindfulness. In conclusion, the pressure of exam stress is a significant toll on your mental health, leading to anxiety, depression, and even suicidal ideation. By promoting self-care, seeking support, and practicing mindfulness, we can help students build their resilience and manage exam stress in a healthy way. 
Remember, exam stress can be a powerful enemy and it can be overwhelming, but it's important to know that you are not alone. Thank you. Thank you, Reem. So Mark, wanna say anything about this speech? Yeah, I think we can definitely all agree that when those summatives start to pile up, it definitely really affects us. We definitely don't have many right now. Yeah. <laughs> Bad job. Okay. So now we would like to welcome our next speaker. This topic may seem initially very weird, but actually it holds profound significance. So Ronnie, welcome to stage. Imagine walking through a bustling city, surrounded by the sights and sounds of urban life. Amidst the busy streets and towering buildings, there's a constant presence that often goes unnoticed. Pigeons. These remarkable animals with their unique history and special skills have long been under misunderstood and underappreciated. Today, I invite you to join me in exploring the most earth-shattering problem you'll hear today. I'm just kidding, but in all seriousness, let's get started. Throughout history, pigeons played a crucial role as messengers, carrying important communications through vast distances. Their reliability and speed made them indispensable during times of war. Pigeons were instrumental in saving countless lives by delivering vital information, their history being one of service and loyalty. You see, pigeons possess extraordinary navigation skills and homing instincts. Researchers have recently discovered that they rely on a combination of magnetic fields, celestial cues, and visual landmarks to find their way back home. Just like a GPS system, they create mental maps, allowing them to navigate through unfamiliar territories and return to their roost with remarkable accuracy. But I didn't just come here to blab on and on about these birds. You see, believe it or not, I came here to discuss an actual issue. Let me explain. When I first started this community project and my TED talk, I only knew one thing for sure. I wanted to talk about pigeons. Yet the more research I did, the more uncertain I became. While I was initially focused on exploring the unknown and underappreciated traits of pigeons, I simultaneously became increasingly aware of the escalating issue of pigeon overpopulation. And it was only a couple weeks leading to my TED talk that I finally realized that there may just be a relation between the two. Unfortunately, the negative perceptions of pigeons as pests have only contributed to the problem of pigeon overpopulation. People often view them as nuisances, associating them with unsightly crowdings and droppings. These negative perceptions have only led to ineffective solutions, such as exterminations and feeding bans, which only offer temporary relief. Just like many aspects in life, it is evident that pigeons, as you can see, aren't simply confined to a single positive or negative side. Rather, there exists a blend of attributes. Then, during negative perceptions surrounding pigeons are the very factors that contribute to the problem at hand. Imagine if we treated pigeons as valuable urban companions rather than pests. Just like a garden with a variety of plants thrives, our urban ecosystem can benefit from the presence of pigeons. By changing our perspective, we can shift the focus to creating e efficient and humane population management strategies. We have already started seeing successful initiatives around the world that promote the coexistence between humans and pigeons. For example, cities have started implementing pigeon towers where pigeons can nest and roost, reducing their impact on public spaces. These initiatives demonstrate that when we embrace the presence of pigeons and recognize their po positive contributions, we can create a, a, a positive living space for both species. Education also plays a vital role in solving the issue of pigeon overpopulation. By sharing the fascinating history and extraordinary abilities of pigeons, we can challenge the negative, the negative stereotypes and and challenge um, a deeper understanding and appreciation of these birds. By educating ourselves and others about the importance of coexistence, we can create a better living space for both species. In just a couple of minutes, we have discussed the, we have explored the world of pigeons. 
from their historical significance to their ex extraordinary abilities and skills. We've also discussed the, the issue of pigeon overpopulation and how our negative perceptions can contribute to this problem. However, by changing our perspectives, we can create a world where pigeons and humans can live together side by side. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. At first, I, I thought pigeons were only some park poopers and uh, flying bats, but you taught me wrong. Same, I thought they had no purpose in life, no offense to pigeons, but okay. So uh, now I would like to welcome our next speaker who also talks about diversity, which is a topic that is very complicated and deep. So Jenny, welcome to the stage. For centuries, the LGBTQ community has faced discrimination. They have been kicked out of their families and communities. They have been denied equal rights and forced to hide their true selves. Thankfully, as the years progress, the world is moving towards more equality and acceptance, but it is still not at the level it should be. Many people in the LGBTQ community are excluded by their friends, classmates, and even families, which is why, is it, why it is important that they have a strong support system and always have people to talk to. My name is Jenny Ashford, and as many of you know, I'm from Slovakia, where the situation with the LGBTQ community is very bad, so I will talk about my experience living there. Alongside this, I sent out an anonymous Google form and asked people from the community who the best support system is and who they can talk to, which I will also discuss in this TED Talk. We all know the statistic. One in 10 people are gay. But did you know that this statistic is in fact incorrect? Based on more recent research, up to 37% of males and 20% of females have a same-sex experience between their teen and adult ages. Because of this, it is very important, because of this high percentage, it is very important that everybody knows that they always have somebody to talk to and always have a strong support system. According to research, up to 60 uh, up to 61% of people in the LGBTQ community suffer from depression and are 3.5 times more likely to commit suicide than their heterosexual peers. Which is why it is important that we, we make sure that everybody knows that they have someone to turn to, especially in, uh, in, uh, sorry, in uh, the environment of school, which I will talk about later. Um, I sent out an anonymous Google form to people who I know that are from the LGBTQ community and asked them to share it along. And the results I got were quite surprising. The first question I asked was, if you've come out, who's the per first person you told? 66% of people replied that the first person they told was a friend. And 33% of people replied that, th that it was a family member. This question, along with the second question, which was, who is your biggest support system, helped me find out who people talk to and who they trust the most. In the second question, um, an astonishing amount of 91% of people said that their biggest support system is friends. Uh, it was very nice to see that everybody selected at least one option in this, in this, uh, in this question, and nobody wrote that they don't have a support system. But this is where it took a bit of a turn. My next question was if they've ever been bullied for being part of the LGBTQ community, and sadly, only 25% of people said they haven't been bullied. The rest said they've been bullied or at least teased for being part of the community. And unfortunately, over half of these people replied that this took place in school. This is just another example of why it is crucial for people in the LGBTQ community, and not just them, but everybody, to have a strong support system. We need to get rid of the discrimination, stereotypes, prejudice, and exclusion of people we consider different, and take a step towards creating a better and more equal world for everybody. Thank you. Wow, Jenny, um, I think we can all agree that diversity is a big problem that needs to be talked about, and here you are talking about it. Thank you. Okay, now, don't fall asleep yet, because now Judith is about to take the stage and talk about a topic that is not so much talked about, blooming beyond conformity. Let's go, Judith. Judith. Imagine a garden filled with various types of flowers, each possessing their own unique colors, shapes, 
and fragrances. These flowers represent individuals in society, each with their own distinct qualities. Now, picture a gardener who tends to these flowers, shaping them to fit a particular pattern or mold. This gardener symbolizes societal norms and expectations, exerting influence on the individuals to conform to a certain standard. Conformity in this context can be seen as the process of shaping each flower to resemble one another, aligning them to, with the desired pattern. It involves altering their natural characteristics to fit the predefined expectations set by the gardener. This process may also involve trimming the petals, adjusting the growth, or even altering the color to match a specific scheme. Conformity is a prevalent phenomenon in human societies, as individuals often feel the pressure to conform to the norms and expectations. Studies in conformity have shown remarkable insights into this human tendency. For example, in a classical experiment conducted by social psychologist Solomon Ash in the 1950s, participants were shown a line and were asked to compare it to three other lines of different lengths. The catch was that the other participants of the experiment were confederates who were instructed to give the incorrect answers during the experiment. And astonishingly, 75% of the participants conformed to the incorrect group consensus at least once, even if the answer was obvious and clear. This experiment highlighted the powerful influence of conformity to individual decision making. In another experiment conducted by psychologist Stanley Milgram in the 1960s, explored obedience to authority figures, Participants were instructed to administer electric shocks to a confederate who is actually not receiving real shocks under the guidance of an authority figure. And despite the confederate's apparent screams of pain, a significant amount of participants continued to administer shocks simply because the authority figure told them to do so. This experiment demonstrated the extent to which an individual may conform to authority, even when it goes against their own moral judgment. These studies and many others reveal the pervasive nature of conformity in our lives. It is a force that shapes our behaviors, attitudes, or even our sense of self. The pressure to conform is subtle yet powerful, influencing our choices, beliefs, and even our interaction with others. As the flowers conform, they start losing their unique features and start becoming more uniform. The diverse tapish, sorry. Um, as the flowers conform, they start losing their unique features and become more uniform. Their vibrant colors might fade, their individual shapes might become less distinguishable, and their fragrance might diminish. This diverse tapestry in the garden gradually transforms into a homogeneous sea of similar looking flowers. The pressure to conform is like a subtle breeze that gently nudges each flower towards alignment. It whispers in their petals, urging them to adopt the approved colors, shapes, and scents. Some flowers, fearful of standing out, readily succumb to this pressure adjusting their appearance to blend in seamlessly with the others. They strive to avoid any deviation, they strive to avoid any deviation from the expected norm, fearing rejection and judgment. However, there are some other resilient flowers who resist the temptation to conform. They stand tall, proudly showcasing their unique colors, shapes, and fragrances. These non-conforming flowers are like rebels in the garden, refusing to sacrifice their individuality for the sake of conformity. These flowers symbolize those who have the courage to embrace their distinctiveness, recognizing that their uniqueness is a source of beauty and strength. And just like the flowers in the garden, we, as individuals in society, face the pressure to conform, face the pressure and 
just like the flowers in the garden, we as individuals in society face the pressure to conform. And it is essential to reflect on the impact of conformity on our identities and consider whether we want to sacrifice our uniqueness for the sake of fitting in. Embracing our individuality, just like these non-conforming flowers, allows us to contribute our distinct perspectives, ideas, and talents, enriching the world with a diversity that fosters progress and understanding. So, let us break free from the constraints of conformity, nurture our individuality, and together, create a garden where every unique flower can bloom and contribute to a more harmonious and vibrant world. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Deep. It's a very deep topic. So um, I like the flower analogy. It definitely got me engaged back there. So yes, who's next? So next up, we've got a pair of students who are very passionate about their topic. And you'll definitely notice this in their speech. And they're going to talk about something that's prolonged. Please welcome Kike and Bruno. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to look at this picture for a second. Probably most of you are thinking, why is he showing us this and how, and how does it relate with our topic? Some of you are maybe um, not thinking about it because you have more important things in your head. For those of you, pay attention. And some of you, um, I guess, that have a slight idea of where I'm getting with this. But, um, um, I want to talk, but before revealing our actual topic, I want to talk about this picture a, a bit. Basically, this was a town in Spain named Acerero, which was completely flooded in 1992. But from then, um, from then, it has been beneath a water reservoir, completely flooded. But 10 years from now, experts started to observe and realize that this um, village started to become more and more visible to the point where this is the village right now, completely visible and entirely above level of water. Um, if you still don't know where I'm getting to, I finally reveal our topic, which briefly, the aim of this talk is to make all of you conscious about droughts, about constant droughts in Spain which using this as an example has made this reservoir of water um, at 15% capacity when it was once at 50 to 60%. Um, as Maximino Perez Romero, a nearby president said, my feeling is that this is what will happen over the years due to drought and all that with climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact that it, um, the fact is that he's not wrong at all. It's true that droughts are a part of life in Spain because we have a Mediterranean climate um, which is close to the equator. So droughts are persistent, but we have never seen this drought be so long lasting and dry as before. Um, um, as Samuel Reyes said, director of Catalan Water Agency, this is the worst period that we have had for the last 100 years. A clear example of this is the following image. Um, as you can see, this is the same reservoir, the same Catalan reservoir, but at two different um, periods of time. This one was earlier and this one was after. But I want all of you to try to guess um, how much time has passed from this um, image to this one. So basically think about how much time has passed. No, don't say it, but think about it. And, and I'm completely sure that if I ask most of you in the audience, no one would have said that this picture was taken in 2021 and this one in 2023. Yes, two, only two years has passed, have passed and all of this water have become in dry lands. Um, com so it has completely become in, in dry lands because it's a matter of fact that climate change exists. So, Kike. 
And why do we want to take action? Well, because this is an issue that will affect all of us. Not only by weakening the agricultural sector to a point in which food production is not enough to feed the entire Spanish population. Not only to the point in which water consumption is practically banned in all of our households. Not only to the point in which wildfires destroy the whole of the Spanish nature which we build up for generations and open the door to a world of desert and lowliness. But to the point in which our whole society and economy are practically destroyed. And all due to the lack of one of the most important elements in our globe, water. Now, this is the point in which you'd expect me and Bruno to come, uh, with, uh, to come with the same speech as everyone else who talks about environmental issues. Ways in which we can prevent it. Which, as you much, must have heard lots of times, are stop littering, reduce CO2 emissions through a decrease in uh, energy consumption in our households, or uh, and also a decrease in water uh, consumption as well in our households. And yes, these are relevant and in fact the core of our comeback of this situation. However, we cannot expect to erase droughts without uh, the contribution of all. Uh, we cannot uh, expect to erase droughts if we do not talk about community awareness, if we do not talk about public engagement, and last but not least, if we do not talk about a constant development of our behavior towards this issue. Because yes, we can make a great difference, but not alone. Every single one of us is not enough. We need to unite in our fight against this problem. We need to start thinking as uh, we, as the Spanish population, need to start thinking as a country and not as individuals. We need to solve this issue as a group. It is due to this that today we will not only ask you to stop littering, to reduce water consumption and to decrease um, uh, your CO2 emissions. Because these are irrelevant without the cohesion and teamwork as well as the implementation of every member of our society in, uh, in this issue. Today, we will ask you to inform uh, all of your relatives of this issue and its, uh, and its importance. Today, we will, ask you, uh, we will ask you to create a group to make a society in order to fight against this concern. Today, we will ask you to unite against droughts. And why should you do this? Well, because if, uh, a Spain with, uh, as future Spain with droughts means a weakened uh, agriculture, a, a practically banned you, uh, consumption of water at, at home, and last but not least, the destruction of the Spanish nature. It is due to this that I respond to your question with, a future Spain with droughts means a worsened nation. Thank you very much. Yo, bro. Wow, I think we can all definitely agree that um, these two are very passionate about their country and their community and it shows in their speech and it's a very pressing topic that we must talk about more. Okay, now we want to welcome the sexiest and the funniest uh, member, uh, audi a member of this uh, TED Talk presentation. So Julius, come off the stage. Not so long ago, I was at a dinner with people I recently met. Laughter was the thread of the interaction and we had so much fun. Until it was time to go home and I was greeted by two not so happy parents because I stayed out too late. After a discussion with my angry parents about uh, behavior, I couldn't help but wonder why at the dinner we seemed to know each other so well despite our limited interactions. This led me to reflect upon the dynamics of our interaction uh, and the profound impact that laughter and humor can have. I consider myself to be a very social person. I like talking to people, uh, making new friends, and especially making people laugh. And I found that laughter and humor are core components when it comes to getting to know people better and bonding with them. Humor is also very important when it comes to social interactions because it can admit vulnerability, build trust, which are all important factors when establishing relationships. You see, laughter has this unique way of breaking down barriers and bridging people closer together. It, also, it has also been shown to, uh, uh, when people listen to information that is presented in a humorous manner, they're more likely to remember it. That's why I decided to tell you some jokes today, so you remember my speech. It's important to laugh now. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Why did Adele cross the road? To say hello from the other side. Why was Adele's phone bill 10,000 euros last month? Because she called a thousand times. You want another Adele joke? All right, but you have to laugh a lot. Adele was recently in a car accident. Witnesses saw her rolling down the Jeep. There are also numerous health benefits associated with laughter. Laughter has been proven to lower stress, enhance the immune system, uh, improve circulation, uh, and it also releases endorphins, which are um, uh, endorphins, which uh, yeah, they are good. <laughs> See, laughing is a primal practice that goes back to when we were monkeys. Uh, that is only if you believe in evolution, though. Otherwise, I guess it goes back to Adam and Eve. I guess they were pretty funny too. Except for the fact that Eve used an Android because she violated the Apple terms and conditions. <laughs> Jokes aside, that night when I came home to my parents, uh, my excuse was I got on the wrong bus. And after their uh, discussion about behavior and responsibility, I now understand that what made us bond so well during that dinner was the power of laughter and humor. See, when we laugh, our brains release endorphins, which are those feel-good chemicals that create a sense of joy. Uh, and your brain subconsciously associates the people you're with with the feeling of um, uh, well-being, which uh, makes your bond stronger and more meaningful. After that night, everybody also felt like they could trust, everybody felt like they could trust each other more except for my angry parents. I lost their trust. Um, so I guess the moral of the story is, listen to your parents. I'm just joking, don't do that. <laughs> Jokes aside, listen to your parents, unless you're having really fun, but just don't use the wrong bus excuse. Thank you very much. Oh, I didn't know it was that good to laugh. Okay, now I'm gonna try to make you laugh. So, what happened when the world's best tongue twister got arrested? They gave him a tough sentence. <laughs> okay, okay, I got a better one. Okay, what did one plate say to the other plate? Dinner's on me. Okay, I'm sorry Julius, but now we gotta stop the jokes, okay? So next up is a more serious topic that uh, shows us a much stricter point of view. Please welcome to the stage, Maria. Imagine walking into a crowded room, your heart pounding, palms sweating, and your mind racing with thoughts of fear and insecurity. For those of us who struggle with anxiety, this can be a daily reality. But despite how prevalent anxiety is, it's often a situation that's often surrounded by negative attitudes and misunderstandings. That's why I'm here today, to share my own experiences with this complex and challenging condition. For many of us, this scenario is way too familiar. Anxiety can feel like a prison, keeping us away from reaching our full potential. But the good news is, there is a way out. Through my own journey and the latest research, I have discovered powerful tools and techniques that can help us manage our anxiety and live more fulfilling lives. Today, I want to share these insights with you and inspire you to take control of your anxiety and unleash your true potential. Hello everyone, I'm Maria, and today I'm going to be talking to, about a topic that's near to our dear hearts, anxiety. Like many of you, I have experience with anxiety and I've seen the impact it can have on different people's lives. Um, my passion for understanding and managing anxiety led me to dive deeper into this topic and um, today I want to share what I've learned with you. 
By joining forces and sharing your experiences, I hope to provide a unique perspective on anxiety and empower you to overcome it. Let's start off. Have you ever struggled with the feeling of fear or insecurity in social situations? For example, you may find yourself in a party thinking, oh, I'm so nervous about being in this party. How will I look? In such a situation, your heart freezes and you're par paralyzed, unable to do anything. Or you may struggle to be calm enough to speak in front of a group of people. Although you may be experiencing anxiety in those scenarios, it is important to recognize that these feelings are a normal human response to any situation. In fact, it is estimated that in the general population, one in five will experience anxiety in some point in their lives. But most people are able to handle these challenges and push through anxiety. But what happens if you're unable to handle these feelings? Are these feelings too much for you to handle? Or if so, when? This is when the term anxiety comes into play. Anxiety can be defined as um, the response we experience when faced with terrifying or frightful situations. It can also be defined as the long-lasting state of uncontrollable fear. Like everyone, you have a unique anxiety threshold. But when this threshold becomes too high for you, you can experience a condition called anxiety disorder. Do you know anyone who has struggled with anxiety? What kinds of things do they develop or find scary? What kinds of behaviors or patterns do they develop to cope with anxiety? One of the best ways to answer this question is uh, to communicate with those people. Um, share your experiences and talk about possible solutions. What kinds of events trigger their anxiety? Uh, what activities do you think they do to manage their anxiety? What types of events trigger their anxiety? I remember participating in a debate in high school a few months ago. Uh, and as I looked at the other participants, they all seemed so much older and more experienced than me. I began to feel very anxious about the situation. My head sort of hurt and I began feeling very anxious. It was also very hot in the room. They didn't have air conditioning, which only made things worse. My head started to hurt, and I felt very, th that I was going to be sick. But despite these overwhelming feelings, I reminded myself that those other people are just human beings like me. Only because maybe they're more experienced or have more knowledge than me, does, that doesn't make them better or more worthy than me. I took a deep breath and gathered my thoughts and delivered my arguments with confidence. And we also managed to win a few debates. That experience taught me a valuable lesson about anxiety. It can be debilitating but it doesn't have to control us. We have the power to overcome our anxiety by recognizing our own worth and focusing on our strengths. I understand having anxiety and depression can feel like being scared and tired at the same time. It's the fear of failure, but no urge to be productive. It's wanting friends, but not wanting to be lonely. It's, want it's wanting to be alone, but not wanting to be lonely. It's feeling everything at once and then feeling paralyzing numb. Anxiety is not something to be ashamed of or to hide from. It's a normal human experience that many of us and you will experience at some point in our lives. But when anxiety starts to interfere with our daily lives, it's time to seek support. Remember, you are not alone in this journey. Together, we can break down the stigma surrounding anxiety and create a supportive community where everyone can thrive. So as I conclude today's talk, I want you to walk away with one single message. You are stronger than your anxiety. No matter how difficult things may seem, you have the power to overcome it and manage your anxiety and to come, overcome any challenges that come your way. Don't let anxiety hold you back from living the life you want. Enjoy and live life. Take the first step towards managing your anxiety by seeking support from your friends, loved ones, or health professional, mental health professionals. Remember, you are not alone, and we believe in you. And always remember, there is hope for a brighter tomorrow. Believe in yourself and your ability to rise above your anxiety. You've got this. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I, uh, now we know how truly light this topic is, and we should not take this as a joke. I know a lot of people who go through anxiety. Next up, we have someone who prove a common mis pr prove wrong a pro common misconception. Please welcome to the stage, future president of Spain, Elena.
Some time ago, I had the idea that to become successful, one should be especially intelligent, have perfect education, have lots of contacts, or just be lucky. This has been tested, and it has no direct correlation with success. Yes, in some cases it might help, but it's not the key to being successful. Have you ever wondered why some people achieve more than others? They seem happier, healthier, they have more work to do, they just seem to get more out of life. This question began to bug me, and I began to research. And I have found out that this is one of the most researched subjects in the world. And there's more information in the subject than in any other era, to the point that we can say success is as predictable as saying that the sun rises from the east and sets from the west. Today, you can become more successful, faster than you ever imagined, if you do one simple thing. Fake it until you make it. This is a technique I, could, I have developed through my research. But first, let's look at what is success. When we look at the difference between humans and animals, we see that animals have something which is called a survival instinct. They hunt to have a place to sleep, to be able to reproduce and to eat. Humans have something which is called a success instinct. A success instinct means that humans are internally driven to succeed. And it is as normal for you to be a successful person as it is to breathe in and to breathe out. And that success you push yourself to do, be, and have is an essential part of your being. We are never satisfied as long as we are alive. We always want more. I have researched the art of faking it until you make it. And I came to the conclusion that this art is very powerful. And I have experienced this firsthand. But first, let's look at another example. In a university, a test was held. They got a random group of students and a random group of teachers. They got these teachers and they told them that they had run an IQ test. And since they were the most qualified teachers, they had assigned them to teach the students had scored the best in the IQ test, aka the geniuses of the university. There was one simple catch. The teachers could not tell the students that they were the ones who had achieved the highest scores. So of course, the teachers started to consciously treat these students as geniuses. And when a real IQ test was actually done, a girl uh, improved her IQ score by eight points. Once the school year ended, the teachers were proud and they started to talk about how noticeable it was that these students were geniuses since they all had achieved perfect grades. But it was later revealed to them that the students had been picked at random and that they were not geniuses at the start. So the teachers came to the conclusion that they had made the students get these perfect and marvelous grades since they were the most qualified of the university. But later on, it was also revealed to them that the teachers were also picked at random. They were told they were the best. They believed they were the best, so they became the best. You can start this as a joke. Tell yourself you're beautiful, intelligent, and competent. It is proven that your subconscious mind can't um, understand sarcasm. That's why when you make a mean joke about yourself, a mean sarcastic joke about yourself, you still feel that pinch of pain. Because in sarcasm, there is some truth. Or at least your subconscious mind thinks that there's some truth in there. Although this can be bad, I have figured out that we can reverse this and turn this into a good factor. Since if you don't feel comfortable with addressing yourself as magnificent and incredible, you can do this through the form of sarcasm, which is normally more socially accepted. I urge you to try this. Tell yourself you have a quality, even though you think you don't have this quality. Be consistent, and then you will simply make it. And if you still don't believe me, look at me now. I faked being a TED Talker, and now I'm making it. Yeah. Thank you, Elena. After that, we won't be faking our shock. Okay, yes, next. Okay, next up to the stage, please give a warm welcome to the dynamic duo Nama and Maria. If we tell you to name all the things you love, how long it will take you to name yourself? 
I think two years ago, I was with my father in Tel Aviv. It's a place in Israel. And then he saw a sentence on a wall and told me to take a picture of it. So I took, but I didn't really understand why. After that, he told me that he thinks that someday it will be important for me. We look at people around us, and not only in terms of appearance, we will always think how perfect they are, how good they look, and how much we would like to be like them. It happens to everyone, everywhere, both boys and girls. And unfortunately, it will never change until we change our way of thinking. Today, we are going to talk about body image. 17 million people in the world suffer from eating disorders. About 80% of the girls ages 9 to 16 are afraid of being fat, and 90% of all the people who suffer from eating disorders are women ages 15 to 25. Now think, are you 100% happy with yourself? Most of the people in the world would answer no. Unfortunately, there are very few people who love themselves and feel confident with the bodies in 100%. What does it happen? Body image. Body image is how you see yourself and how you imagine you look. Today, in our society, how you look is one of the most important things. We want to look like people want us to look. Most of the boys prefer thin and curvaceous girls, and most of the girls prefer fit boys with muscles. And when it's like this, we start thinking, what would happen if I become fat? What would happen if I don't have muscles or curvaceous body? Body image is not only about your weight, it's about everything. Your face, skin, legs, nose. You need to learn how to love your body. When you talk about the person that you want to be like him or her, or look like him or her, you don't really know what he really thinks about himself what he really goes through in his life. Maybe he also looks in the mirror and likes what he sees, isn't sure about himself, or thinks exactly the same as you think. These thoughts about how we look are often influenced by things that happen around us. It could be what we see every day on social media, what the characters we see on TV look like, or think that testaments about improving how you look. All of these can contribute how we feel about our bodies. The body we want depends on the view of others. This means that if Aaron would like to have a chubby body, so you would want it too. Social media promotes what should be that perfect body image. Many of people on Instagram or TikTok put filters, and we also want to be like that. But that's not reality. There is also who are beautiful. They are simply natural. So I mean, nowadays it is very difficult to have that perfect body image. And that's why many of us now don't like their bodies. If you feel like you're comparing your body, you're not alone. Many of us now don't like their bodies, and comparing their bodies to people and things that happen around us, which can affect our mental health. Our body is our home. It will go with us to everywhere in our life. You have to learn to love it. Being thin shouldn't be the key of happiness. A person that loves himself from the inside just radiates out. That is so sure of who you are that weight or appearance is not longer a factor. We hope 2023 will be your most self-love because that's the most important thing. Thank you very much. What a way to represent the peers of the world talking about a, the body image, a significant topic in today's society. Now we'd like to welcome someone talking about a certain yellow and black animal. Please welcome to the stage, Launive. Hi. Um, it is a well-known saying, sorry, wait, I'm gonna stand here. <laughs> it's a well-known saying that without bees, we would go extinct. Many people think this is a myth, a lie, a story told to children so that next time they see a bee, they'll think twice without stepping on it. However, this is actually an understatement because not only would we go extinct, so would hundreds and thousands of other animals. Without bees, our ecosystem would fall apart. They are essential for biodiversity within our world. But we are killing them. They are slowly dying and we are to blame. Did you know that 24% of Europe's bumblebee, bee, uh, bumblebee species are th uh, threatened by extinction? An even more alarming statistic is in the American bumblebees, where their population has decreased by 90% in the last 23 years. The, the main cause of 
their deaths are habitat loss. And that's because of us, because we are destroying their habitat and we are taking it away. Did you know that there's actually three ki different kinds of bees in a hive? There's the queen bee. This is one that you're all probably familiar with. She's the leader of the, thing, uh, of the hive and um, she's kind of like the sun in their solar system. Everyone else revolves around her. Then we have the workers. The workers harvest the nectar and pollen, they create the honey, and they, do, they build the hive. They do all of it. Um, they are the females. And then we have the males. Much like in people, the males are lazy and a bit useless. But not completely. <laughs> Com not completely useless though. They have one job, and their one job is to reproduce. They, are, they have to reproduce with the queen bee during nuptial flight, and even after that, they die. This has proven that bees are social animals, but they are also intelligent animals. They can recognize colors, shapes, they can even do simple maths. But what's really, speci uh, what's really special about them is that they have time perception. What do I mean by time perception? I mean that they can perceive time like we will never. They don't need clocks or watches to tell what, how much time has passed. They just need their minds. This is because of their circadian clocks. This is a rhythm within your mind that indicates what time of day it is. We have it too. Ours tells us whether it's night or day, whether we should sleep or whether we should stay awake. Theirs tells them hours and minutes, so specific we could never imagine. However, the discovery of this is what I'm most interested in because it happened in a very interesting way. It started in 1929 in Munich, Germany, uh, where Ingeborg Belling, a fem uh, the, one of the first female chronobiologists, started an experiment where, uh, and she named the paper on the time memory of bees. I probably won't translate this to German because other than Mr. Chris, I'm not so sure about your level of it, but um, I'll just keep it to English. Um, she wrote an experiment which she performed where she trained a beehive to leave their hive at 4 p.m. every day in search of a bowl of water and sugar which she had laid out for them. After a few days they seemed to understand this and they understood that 4 p.m. equals food. So they, left their, uh, so they left their hive consistently at 4 p.m. each day. Not one, minute, one, not one minute before, not one minute after, always 4 p.m. So her conclusion was Bees have time perceptions, but other scientists didn't agree. They thought that maybe they were me measuring the sun or how the light was changing. So they performed the experiment again, this time in complete darkness. And yet again, the bees left the hive at 4 p.m. Of course, it is a scientist's job to doubt. So they thought maybe it was because of the temperature of the day that they could know. So it was performed again, this time in a salt mine where the temperature was consistent and the light never changed. And yet again, the bees left their hive at 4 p.m. As I said before, scientists always doubt things. That's their job. So people started to think maybe it was because they could read the angulation of the Earth. Even though that could be incredible, people still believed that they have a perception of time. And so one scientist went out to prove it. He trained a hive in Paris to leave their hive at 4 p.m. For, the, for their food. And then he flew them to New York um, and set up his experiment again. And the bees left the hive at 10 a.m. because they were jet lagged. They left their hive exactly 24 hours after they first did. Incredible, isn't it? Um, bees are vital to our environment. And that's why we should help them. So how can we? There are so many things we can do, ranging from little to big. We can make sure that uh, the products we buy in supermarkets are eco-friendly. We can plant some flowers in the back garden that bees might like. We could help, pr uh, we could help and donate to environmental conservation, uh, nature conservation organizations. We can help the bees with the tiniest things because as we all know now, even the smallest thing such as a bee can make such a big difference. Thank you. Well, Laniv, I think you gave me a great idea. I'll probably use a B for my next math homework. Okay, yes. 
Uh, now I didn't know so much about bees now, but nor did I know I could be this happy that we're almost close to the end. Okay, we know there's been a lot of information taken, but we still have one more speaker to talk about something yet to come. Please welcome to the stage, Isabel. I am a student. I, as well as everyone else here, is a student. And we are only 30% of our population. We wake up every single morning at 6 a.m., 5 a.m., 7 a.m., go to school, stay there 10 hours each day, five days a week, and for around 20 years of our entire lives. But the truth is, yes, we students could be just 30% of our population, but at the very same time, we are 100% of the future. And today, I do not only serve my job as a Tech Talk speaker, but also as a messenger of your children, students, and in this case of students, friends. And I'm aware that after 10 minutes of our speech, or five minutes, or even one hour, you will completely forget everything that I've said. But maybe in 10 or 20 years, you will suddenly get this nostalgia and remember about this Tech Talk speech. And then you realize that my speech is not only a speech, but it is also a warning of what could happen in the future. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Isabel Dyer, and today I'm going to talk about a crucial topic that's related to everyone today, which is education. Now, you might be wondering, what do most schools teach in education today? So for this, I need everyone to stand up. Thank you. Now, I need everyone to raise one of their hands like this. OK, thank you. And now sit back down. <laughs> so what most schools teach, besides learning, is also to be obedient. And why do we teach students to be obedient? Why do we teach them to have the best work producing? Why do we teach them and grade them in how they produce their work? Well, this is because, as you can see in the next picture, this is a car, one of the first cars ever invented. Now, you can see in the next picture, this is one of our most modern cars. There's a big difference. We certainly develop new technology, and the car co looks completely different to the first one we ever invented. But then, if you look to the next picture, this is a classroom from 100 years ago. And then in the next picture, this is a classroom from now. Now, you barely see any difference. It's because we have not been able to adapt and conform with our new technology and other problems that we have faced. And we have been stuck in what we were in the past. And in the past, certainly, we didn't need workers. We didn't need obedient people, factory workers, etc. But that's not what we need today. Today, they invented new technologies. For example, ChatGPT. And ChatGPT does many, many of the things that we needed at that time. We needed obedient workers that produce essays in the shortest time possible. Then we have ChatGPT. And we needed perhaps factory workers. And we have machinery for that. But that's not what we need right now. And what we need right now are creative people who think, observe, and also we need schools who are willing to compromise with our new technologies. And this school is one of the examples. But in other parts of the world, such as Latin America, where I live, that is not the case. In my school, they did not allow anyone, any single student, to use ChatGPT. And this is because, because they were scared of the possible consequences. They were scared that we lose the critical thinking and other stuff like that. But the problem with prohibiting the new technologies in schools is that it is inevitable. I'm not going to deny maybe ChatGPT ends up destroying the world. Maybe it ends up taking away critical thinking. But that is depending because we have two options. We could either just prohibit ChatGPT and just wait until the inevitable, or we can just adapt to the new problems. We can teach our students how to use that tool of ChatGPT and new artificial intelligence and actually be able to manage to adapt. And that, that is why we must remember that students might be just 30% of our population, but students, parents, and teachers are also 100% of our future. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I think it's very important to look forward to the future. We need to work on it. So, yes. Okay. Um, we're done with the speeches, but now we have two people who'd like to talk to you first. Welcome the last duo of the day, uh, Emma and Noemi. Um, 
to end the session, we would like to thank all of the presenters that have had the course to come up here on stage today and present their amazing speeches with such unique topics that have made us think and reflect all throughout the way. We would also want to take a moment to express our more sincere gratitudes to all of the people that have been here with us in the audience listening to these wonderful speeches and to thank all of the speakers for their marvelous speak speeches and hard work. We would like to um, congratulate them by giving each one of them a certificate that will fully represent all of the hard work they have put into their speeches. So let's get started. The first, the first certificate goes to Nama Weisberg. The next one is for Maria Ribachuk. The next certificate goes to Jennifer Ashford. The next one is for Launif Weber. The next one goes to Arnaud Bretons Elsa. <laughs> the next one is for Maria Savage. The next one goes to Ronnie Schwartz. <laughs> the next one is for Julius Bendelin. <laughs> the next certificate goes to Isabel Dyer. The next one goes to Elena Meischer Guzman. The next certificate goes to Aitian He. This next one is for Rim Almarsuki. The next certificate goes to Bruno Alvarez Camacho. This one is for Enrique Rodman Suarez. Then a certificate goes to Cristina Jan. And last but not least, this certificate goes to Judith Chu. <laughs> Now we would like to ask all the teachers that have helped, that have helped us make everything possible to come up here on stage so that we could take a group picture.